they treat us like garbage. They say, well, you, you know, you're gay, you know, you got that, you know, disease and stuff like that, but it's not a gay disease anymore. This disease is not a white disease. It's not a black disease. It's not an Asian disease. It's not a Latin disease. It's not a Hindu, whatever your religion. If you are bisexual, straight, on the down low, in the closet, out the closet, it affects everybody across the board. Everybody needs to get tested. With all the new drugs out, it's mainly a manageable, you know, disease. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. I grew up on the north side of Chicago. Um, as a child, um, I'm a victim of uh, rape. I'm a victim of uh, many things, but I don't claim it now as an adult. But it messes with me throughout my life, you know? And um, it is what it is. I grew up, like I said, on the north side of Chicago to maybe about 12 years old. Uh, I was raped by my stepfather over and over for maybe about seven years. Um, my mother was a very abusive woman. I was tortured, like, um, as a child. My mother was physically abusive to me probably every day since I've known her as a young child. My mother's a heroin addict, still is, I know. An alcoholic, she's HIV positive. She's been that way for a long time and um, My father, stepfather um, sexually abused me for many years as a child. And, uh, I don't like talking about it, but I'm grown now. I'm 34 and it's time to talk about things that I don't like to talk about. I like to keep that life in a box but being around people in different situations, sometimes it comes up, but yeah. Uh, my stepfather abused my mother. Um, he gave her HIV and me, uh, and he sexually abused me and her for many years. And um, I hate him. <laughs> I don't get along with my mother. She's in the hospital now uh, for smoking um, too much. When a person being violated like that, a lot of people don't talk or say anything. I was one of those people. I remember all the times he would take me out of my bed as a child and bring me to the living room in the corner and do whatever. I would just take myself out of my body and let him do whatever. And this happened for many years. He always said, if I ever told, he would slaughter my whole family and me. And run off somewhere. But my real father, he was a pimp. I remember as a child being around all those women and him using cocaine and he thought he could buy me McDonald's to make me happy. It did make me happy. A Big Mac and <laughs> stuff like that and balloons. But he wasn't really a father. He was just there. I don't get along with him either. We don't have a relationship. Is it funny to say that a person don't love their mother? I don't. 
I know there's a lot of people out here that feel that same way. I don't have any love for my mother. If she passed away, I wouldn't have any emotion or my father, okay? Thanks for giving birth to me, but uh, I don't have a relationship with them. Like I said, my mother's in the hospital today. Well, she went in yesterday um, to cut one third of her uh, lungs off. And she's in critical condition, but I don't care. I don't. I mean, I feel bad, but I'm not going to cry, and I may not go to her funeral when she passed away. I'm not evil. That's just how I feel. A lot of people say, you judging her and stuff like this. Until a person step on my shoes and, and, and realize what I went through as a child, they will understand how I feel. But the one thing I can say, my mother kept food on the table and clothes on our back, even though she did what she could. That's the only thing I can say good about my mother. I didn't like all the men in the house coming in and out. I seen a lot as a child that a child shouldn't see. I remember when I was like 11, and my mother was in the bathroom for like two hours, and I'm like, what's she doing in the bathroom? So my sister walked in there. She picked a lock on the bathroom, and my mother was sitting on the toilet, nod, nodding with a mirror in her lap and a straw. And that was the first time that I seen some things that I shouldn't have seen. But I, I asked myself, why is all these men in here? Men everywhere. Like, they stank too. Like, guys off the block. My mother was a prostitute too. She did what she could to survive. But she neglected her kids because she was so high all the time. High and drunk. Some days I remember laying in the bed with her while she was high because that was the only time sometimes when she was sick. She would have Golden Girls on as a child. That's why I love the Golden Girls now because that's my fondest memory of my mother sitting there watching Blanche and Rose and Dorothy and Sophia, just laying there, even though my mother was high, drunk, sick, or whatever. But I, that was one time, a couple times, I would lay in the bed with her and watch the Golden Girls. That's why I love that show today, because it gives me memories. You know, a lot of people watch these shows and they're like, oh, this don't mean nothing. Some of these shows that I watch, it have meanings to it. Significant meanings from my childhood. My name is Rick Tierney. I was born and raised here in Wisconsin, actually in Milwaukee on the north side. Um, and then from there, I ended up moving to Michigan because I was a skater. And I um, went to high school at a private um, high school at the rank, which was called the National Academy of Academics. Um, and then from there, I went to um, a university in Michigan and obtained my bachelor's in nursing. And I also have my advanced life-saving skills license um, because I used to work with the choppers for 14 years. But the only thing that I've ever asked out of a, um, a mate or a partner is just don't cheat. And what happened is he went and he cheated. And I ended up getting syphilis and almost dying along with the syphilis and the HIV. Back then, all 
there was was AZT. Okay, as far as you know the drugs go, um, because what I've had HIV since 1988. You know, so I'm considered a long-term survivor, actually. In the early days, uh, AZT in particular was a very difficult drug to take because it required that the patient be, first of all, all of these medications require that the patient is 100% compliant. And I'm not sure about you, but I struggle to remember to take a multivitamin once a day. Uh, and back in the day when these medications were every four hours, one of the things we gave out along with prescriptions for AZT were little alarm clocks because uh, the gentlemen that were living with HIV at the time had to wake up at midnight and and four and eight and make sure that they stayed absolutely on top of that dose which uh, is a very complicated thing to do. Back then too we also had what was called drug holidays you know where your doctors would say well okay you know you've been doing good with your meds now you can take some time off you know um, and what they ended up finding out was that was actually worse, you know? So, I mean, the consistency of your meds is very, very important. Meds today are uh, same, same, you know, still stringency and, and need for people to be very compliant with the meds, but today the meds have, have evolved to where you can take a regimen that's once a day or twice a day. Um, some of the making the compliance issues get better because they're, they're as potent, if not more potent, than the medications we had back in the day, but they're easier to take. That a tripler is the best medication because it got three in one pill. I take one pill a day. I'm happy because I know people who take 10 and 15 pills every six hours, you know? Like I said, I took the AZT and AZT at that time was such a rough drug because it wasn't refined, you know, how it is now. I mean, as far as side effects go and stuff like that, there were so many side effects with that drug. It's, I mean, just unreal. I would say the, the, the largest block of side effects that we see in people taking medications of, of this variety is they're very tough on a person's general, uh, their ability to feel strong. They, they, they can be very debilitating to your system, make you feel weak, make you feel tired. Uh, often these medications come with some level of stomach or abdominal side effects which can make life pretty miserable. Uh, if you've ever had bad chicken in a restaurant for, and that eight hours is suffering, then sometimes these medications can leave you with pretty long-lasting uh, belly symptoms that can be very devastating as well. I think overall people complain of, of tiredness, of headaches, of body aches with these medications, and belly symptoms with them um, for at least a few days, if not a few weeks, until their bodies adjust to the medicines and then they came along with a drug called Crixivan, which was, it was considered a lucrative drug because only people who could afford it could actually get it, you know, and I had to pay for it at that time, which was like 1400 a month, just for the Crixivan, <laughs> you know. Um, just to give you an, an example of how our, our drugs go, um, last year, my prescription cost was forty was forty thousand one hundred eighty two dollars, just for my prescriptions alone. You know, so it's not a cheap disease. Before I came here, I wasn't taking my medication because I wanted to be thin. Because that was the good. That's what everybody was doing. They wasn't taking their medication in Chicago so they could be thin. I was wanting to be accepted because in this lifestyle, and my lifestyle, if you don't look like a model, or have a nice body, and have your pants hanging off your butt, don't nobody want to talk to you. As far as like 
telling my parents, it took me a good two weeks to get up enough guts to go down there and actually tell them. And what happened, which just surprised the hell out of me, uh, my mom started crying, my dad started crying, and my dad stood up and he gave me the biggest hug that I've ever had in my whole entire life. Because, um, I mean, my dad and I, we were never really close, but we weren't at odds with each other. We just weren't that close, okay? Because my dad worked long hours and, you know, everything else. My dad, like I said, was crying and he got up off the kitchen table and he just gave me the biggest hug and he told me he loved me and he would do whatever it takes for me to be well. You know, and he has stuck by that. Um, he has just turned out to be the, one of the greatest parents I've ever had and my mom is just absolutely fantastic. She was she was like in total agreement with my dad. She goes, Rick, whatever you need, don't you ever go without medication. If the doctor tells you you need medication, you can't afford it, we'll buy it. Let me tell you a story how I got here. Okay, so I'm in Chicago and my best friend, she lived here at the time. And she was like, oh, you should come on down and stuff like that, and it's nice. And I never grew up in an area like this. Well, it's quite, this is always what I always wanted. So I grew, always grew up in the ghetto. Always grew up in the ghetto. Hood, gunshots, dudes walking down the street robbing, people killing, uh, people asking for cigarettes, booze, everyday pedophiles, rapists, all that. I've seen it. I've seen everything under the sun. I've seen people get thrown in car trunks, all kind of stuff. Hey, I've seen it all. But then when I moved here five years ago, my whole life changed. My best friend, she like, come on down. And I did. It took me two visits to visit Waukesha. And I was like, I love it. The reason I love it because this is the life I always wanted. Quiet. I can go about my business without nobody bothering me, harassing me. But there's crime everywhere. But a Waukesha, the crime is like 10% versus Chicago, where crime is like 60 or 70. That's a big difference. So I moved down here and I slept on my friend floor for two months. I had brought a couple thousand dollars with me from saving from my old job. And I lived off of that. Then I came here because I wanted to find some services, people who are positive. And I came. And that's why I met Corey and my old case manager. I was like, I don't like it. They too lovey. They care. That's because I never got that as a child. So, what do a person do? They go into an egg. I wouldn't have took this egg like, mm, no. They too caring. Don't nobody care like that. It has to be a hidden agenda. But then in actuality, it was not a hidden agenda. They love everybody. I needed to care. And we had to find some place that I could get the care that I needed. You know? Um, and my old case manager found, found Richard's place. And um, they happened to have an opening at the time, and I just thank God for it, you know. Um, because, I mean, this is like the best place I've, I've like ever been, really, you know. I don't know, if it wasn't for this place, I don't know what I would have really done. I mean, I wasn't, 
actually homeless because I was with another program before this, but you know, I was just screwing up so bad with medication and I mean, you name it, it was awful. Our meds that are, that are given to us on time, which I mean, for me is a lifesaver, you know? Um, there's just so many aspects of this place that they, they take care of everything that we actually need. I mean, there isn't one staff member here that if we had to wear diapers, wouldn't change us. You know what I mean? Um, they're all just so good to us. I mean, they take care of us. This is how I always wanted to live since a child. I wanted to live in peace and harmony and a loving environment. And this is what Richard's place has done for me. I tell you, I will lay down my life for this place because they changed my life. It changed my life. Have you ever worked somewhere and the whole place changed your life? That happened for me and I love it. Some days are good, some days are not. But hey, that's life, you keep on going. I mean, it's just a dream, actually, you know? Um, it's like, too bad I have to be sick to be here. <laughs> I'm here today to let everybody know out there in this world that you could be sexually assaulted. And grew up like I did and not be in jail and not turn out to be like them. You don't have to be an alcoholic. You don't have to be a pedophile. I was, I'm happy that I didn't turn out like that because so many people do. They grew up in this life and they turned out to be a pedophile or prostitute or a full-fledged alcoholic. And I'm just, I'm happy to be here. It's important to get tested. And if you become positive, it's gonna be rough. I say the first year when you become positive, that's the roughest year for you. Anything after that, you'll be all good. And you have to go to meetings and support groups and talk to people. A lot of people are so scared, ooh, they gonna talk about me. Ooh, they gonna do this to me. Ooh, they gonna say, and they talked about Jesus. <laughs> Who cares if a person talk about you? I don't. They talk about me forever and a day. I don't care. As healthcare providers, as nurses, as, as anybody touching the lives of anybody with a, with a devastating, difficult illness, if you don't treat the things they most need in their lives, housing, food, support, you're never going to get to their medical issue and you're never going to treat them effectively if you just say, here are your meds, go. You have to offer those life support systems in order to make them pay attention to, oh, I'll take care of that later. Often medically, that's what we all do. Certainly HIV infected people aren't any exception to that. So. I want to be a better person for me. I want to be a better person to my residents. I want them to see things in me that they've never seen before. I want to be a better person. I don't like to be loud. I want to calm my voice. But I didn't grow up like that. But I want a much more subtle voice. I want a relationship with God. I have a relationship with a man. And live happily ever after and be financially stable. And I want a hundred thousand richest places all across America. 
as we need her. We do. And that's all I'm going to talk about.